guess I'll just start the slideshow. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome here. Here we are again. It seems like yesterday that <clears throat> I was doing a seminar. Only yesterday, my voice was a little bit better than it is today. I have a bit of laryngitis, so I apologize up front if I sound a little funny. We're going to be talking today about an extremely interesting topic. We've been talking about intrauterine insemination and in vitro fertilization and comparing the two and seeing when a woman needs one versus the other. So IVF and IUI are of course completely two different procedures. With intrauterine insemination, you're passing a thin catheter through the cervix into the uterus. Can we get the screen to show up properly here? I don't put the slide on that. I mean the slides are large. Like you do. Um, put it like it usually is. That's that's how you can do you want to advance because it? The format. Go to the format first. Right. Um, with intrauterine insemination, you're passing a thin catheter into the uterine cavity and injecting washed and enhanced sperm into the uterus, the premise being that if you injected the sperm fresh that was, uh, was uh, prepared and enhanced in the laboratory into the uterine cavity, closer to where the egg will be coming down through the tube, you'll basically improve the chances of pregnancy occurring. And with IVF, as you know, we, fit, we remove the eggs from the woman's body after fertility drugs. We fertilize them outside the body, and then we put the resulting embryo into the uterus. Our topic is going to be to compare these two unequal options and uh, see which is, what is intended for which type of patients. The format that today is going to be that I'll basically present a 40... Uh, minute presentation and then it will be followed by a question and answer session. You can put your questions down in the chat box as we go along and I'll get to them in the order that they appear as we go. I also wanted to say that any additional questions that might come up later after the seminar is over uh, will also um, be answered if you submit them either to our website haveababy.com and uh, go to the SRM Las Vegas discussion board or you post your questions on my blog which many of you know called ivfauthority.com um, Finally, we'll, I'll mention this again later everybody who attends the seminar should feel free to schedule a free consultation via Skype with me all you need to do is call this number on the screen 800 7807437 and speak to Tina and ask her to set you up with a Skype consultation and we'll have an hour on the phone to discuss your specific issues. So I want to talk to start with a little bit about the general scope of infertility and then funnel that into the IUI IVF alternatives. Just to put things in perspective so we all can understand how big this problem is that you are confronting at the moment, one out of eight couples overall in America is unable to conceive within one year of trying. But the older the woman gets, the greater the likelihood of a problem. At age 30 to 34, it's actually one in six couples that is infertile. And between 35 and 39, one in four. And when you get into your 40s, 40 in the early 40s, one out of every two couples one out of every two women will be infertile because of age. And the main reason for this is that as women get older, egg quality declines. And as I've repeatedly uh, presented in previous discussions, this is primarily due to changes in the chromosomal configuration of the woman's eggs. And when we look at the causes of infertility in broad scale, we're looking really at two groups, two large groups, and one smaller group. Half of infertility is due to the female, close to half, about 40%, is due to male-related problems, and in 10% of cases, no matter what we do, we're unable to find the cause initially. Most of these that fall into this category of unknown or unexplained really are cases that have been undiagnosed because we haven't gone the full gamut of doing all the necessary tested, tests to make the determination. 
In the case of female infertility, the commonest causes relate to tubal disease, where the woman's fallopian tubes are damaged or blocks, blocked. In third world countries, this is by far the commonest cause, but not so in America, where ovulation factors are probably the most common. Then there's the egg factor, which primarily is related to the woman's age or to the coexistence of certain types of problems such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, where egg quality is often compromised. And then there's finally the uterine factor, which is the inability of the embryo to find a hospitable environment to attach. These are the main causes of female infertility, which comprises half of all infertility in America. And in 40% of cases, it's the man. This is often much more difficult to treat and very resistant to traditional methods of treatment other than IVF with intracytoplasmic sperm injection, and we'll talk about that later. When we evaluate before treating any woman with infertility, we have to bear in mind that we have to look at a number of factors before moving into treatment. First, we have to determine whether the woman has normal pelvic anatomy, and that means are her fallopian tubes open, are they patent, and is it possible for a sperm and egg to meet in the tube and then for the resulting embryo to travel back to the uterus. So pelvic anatomy is best assessed by doing an ultrasound examination which shows the presence of diseases such as fibroids in the uterus or tumors in the ovary. But the basic standard test is the hysterocell pingogram, where we basically inject dye into the tubes to see if the tubes are open. Unfortunately, the hysterocell pingogram is not as reliable when it comes to looking for small little lesions inside the uterus itself, because the dye we inject is radio-opaque, and in injecting it will often obscure small lesions such as polyps or scar tissue. To diagnose these better, we'll discuss this later when we get to the uterine receptivity issue, we need to look inside the uterus with a hysteroscope directly inside or do a hysterosonogram, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the hysterosalpingogram is the standard test. It is not a painless procedure. It does cause discomfort as it, the, the dye going into the uterus distends the uterus, and if the tubes are blocked and force is used to try to force the dye through the tubes, that can cause tubal distension and pain. But the biggest problem with hysterosalpingogram is that it can cause, in a small percentage of cases, infection in the tubes. And that can damage tubes that otherwise might have been normal. And in other cases, the woman can have an allergy to the dye used to inject into the uterus. And when that happens, it can cause serious systemic com complications. So HSG, although it's done just randomly and people think it's the simplest, easiest test, it can have certain problems associated with it. And then most importantly, while it does track the dye going through the uterus and through the tubes, so you can see if they're open and get a general idea of the configuration of the uterine cavity, it doesn't tell you much of what's going on outside the tubes. And you can't see conditions such as endometriosis or conditions such as flimsy pelvic adhesions. You also can't judge the extent of adhesions that are blocking tubes because you can't see outside the fallopian tubes. Then there's laparoscopy where a telescope-like instrument is passed through the belly button into the pelvic cavity and the abdomen is inflated with carbon dioxide allowing separation of, of organs and structures so you can see directly if there are conditions and diseases and by the way this is the only way to diagnose endometriosis. It's also a way in which you can test to see if dye flows freely through the tubes, as with the HSG. But in addition to this, the laparoscopy allows you to look at the extent of disease in the pelvis, adhesions that may be present around the tubes, and this is very important. The second thing we've got to know is, is the woman ovulating? And the only real proof of ovulation is pregnancy. All the other tests tell us that the changes that are taking place that would lead to ovulation or the changes that have occurred after ovulation are present. For example, if we do an, an 
ovulation predictor kit test on the urine or measure the woman's LH and both measure LH the over-the-counter the ovulation predictor test done as a dipstick in the urine tells you if there's LH in the urine and the LH in the blood is more accurate than is the urine test but not as convenient and then there's of course the progesterone measurement that you measure in the blood because after a woman's ovulated the the, the follicle that releases the egg, the little fluid-filled space that pops the egg is then called a corpus luteum and it produces estrogen and progesterone and if you measure progesterone you will know if those changes have taken place. The problem is that you can measure progesterone in the blood and suggest the woman's ovulated but sometimes the changes take place in the follicle that would otherwise occur with ovulation but the egg is not released. And this is called luteinized unruptured follicle or LUF syndrome, L-U-F. It's very common in women who take clomiphene for a long period of time. In fact, 20% of women who go on clomiphene develop this trapped ovulation or LUF. And then they'll have progesterone in the blood, but there'll be no egg having been released from the ovary. An ultrasound examination can tell you if the follicle has collapsed. What happens is that the follicle distends to about 18 to 22 millimeters before ovulation and then it releases the egg and if you then come back a day later you sometimes will see the follicle having collapsed and you'll see a collection of fluid behind the uterus in the pelvis which tells you that the fluid in the follicle was expelled and that this is probably a sign of ovulation. But again it, it's, it can be difficult to assess and it is only a relative indication. The basal body temperature chart is based upon the fact that after a woman ovulates, her temperature goes up slightly and stays up until she's about to menstruate again. And it's progesterone, this hormone here, that does it. So the basal body temperature chart only tells you in retrospect when the woman is likely to have ovulated because you'll see a biphasic temperature. First it's flat, then it goes up and stays up. The next point we need to evaluate is, does the woman have the ability to produce eggs in response to fertility drugs? And this and how many she's likely to produce to a given type of fertility stimulation. To measure this, we look at the, am the, the, am the uh, antral follicle count how many little follicles you see in the ovary, small little follicles of a few millimeters in size when the cycle begins. The, you can measure FSH in the woman's blood on the second to fourth day of the cycle, and the higher the FSH is above nine, the lower her ovarian reserve is likely to be. You can measure inhibin B in the blood, and if that's under 35, it usually points towards the fact that the woman has got severely diminished ovarian reserve. And the most valuable of all is to measure a new hormone called anti-Mullerian hormone or AMH. This one can be measured any time in the cycle. And if the AMH level in the units we measure in America is over two nanograms per milliliter, that usually points towards ample reserve. If it's one to two, it's in a gray zone, and if it's under two, ovarian reserve is diminishing. If the reserve drops below 0.5, then it's very, very low, and probably the woman's headed imminently towards a menopause. So measuring these levels in the woman's blood can help you, and doing the antral follicle count is also helpful by ultrasound. Remember that with the uh, with the AMH level, with the anti-Mullerian hormone, women with diseases or conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome often have very elevated AMH levels. But this is helpful because when you use, a, you choose a method of ovarian stimulation, the higher the AMH, the greater the risk of overstimulating the woman, and you've got to be very careful in selecting the protocol. There's no such thing as a one size fits all for everybody. The next thing we evaluate is for male factor. And the standard method of testing is the semen analysis. We'll show you a normal, how a normal semen analysis would look. Another newer test is looking at the DNA in the sperm. This is called a sperm chromatin structure assay, 
where we really look at for fragmentation of DNA in the sperm, and that's helpful. And then in some cases, you need a full urologic examination to exclude conditions like varicoceles, where there's a collection of varicose veins inside the scrotum, heating up the environment and compromising sperm, or occlusions or blockages of the ducts that carry the sperm through the penis at ejaculation, and to look for other tumors or conditions inside the scrotum. Then there's the one, uterine receptivity, just like a seed that you plant in the soil, you can put the best seed in the soil, but if the soil is non-receptive, it's not going to accept the, the seed. The soil in this case, the seed is the embryo and the soil is the uterine lining. And you need to have a certain thickness of the uterine lining. We were the first to ever show this in 1998, and we showed that if the lining was under 9 millimeters, and definitely under 8 millimeters at the time of ovulation, or at the time of the peak stimulation of fertility drugs before the woman ovulates, she is likely to have, more likely to have a less receptive lining allowing the embryo to implant. So we look at the lining for thickness and appearance around the time of ovulation, whether it's induced or on its own. Then there are tests that look at the structure of the uterus to exclude surface lesions because we know that if there are things growing in the uterus like polyps or, fi or fibrous scar tissue from a previous infection or if there is a fibroid growing into the wall of the uterus and protruding into the cavity that that uterus will not easily receive an embryo and allow it to implant properly. So the, histro <coughs> salpingo, the histrosonogram we inject a little bit of dye into the uterine cavity. It slightly distends the uterus. And then as the uterus distends, you can do an ultrasound and map out the contour much more reliably than you can with a hysterosalpingogram and exclude the presence of polyps or scar tissue or fibroids growing into the inside of the uterus. And then finally, there's hysteroscopy, where you literally put a thin telescope through the opening of the cervix, you look inside the uterus and you can see what's going on after you've injected fluid in to distend the cavity slightly. The final factor that can affect receptivity of the uterus we've spoken about many times is whether there are immunologic problems. And we test for that when there's a woman who has a predisposition. One of the predispositions that are very important are women with endometriosis where a third of them will have activation of certain immune cells in the uterus known as natural killer cells and these release toxins that damage the root system of the embryo and prevent it from attaching. The other case where we look for it is when there's unexplained or unknown infertility. Very often the woman will have activated uterine natural killer cells in the uterine lining without any predisposing factor. And the only way you know it is you can find nothing else to explain why she's not getting pregnant. She's young, she's got normal ovarian reserve, she is able to, she's producing eggs easily, and her tubes are open, but yet she's not getting pregnant. And then you need to consider the possibility of an immunologic cause, which today is relatively easily treated, and is often a cause for unexplained infertility. So then, how does age affect fertility? Here you can see, I'm not going into detail, but you can see that as women get older, two things happen. Their fertility goes down, and their ability to conceive drops, such that when the woman reaches uh, the age of 45, a chance of getting pregnant is dismal. It's in single digits, and it's very, very low per month of trying. As she gets, as she gets older also, the risk of miscarriage goes up. In both cases, the causes are usually the same, and they usually again relate to the fact that the embryo is more likely to be abnormal, because as the woman gets older, her egg quality declines, and this affects the embryo, and this being the major cause of failure to conceive, as well as the cause of miscarriages increasing in number. And then here sh it shows you again what happens in terms of the woman's eggs, how many of them are likely to be normal as the woman gets older. When a woman's young, in her early 30s or even below 30, 
almost one in two eggs is normal, but when she gets to her early 30s, it's about 40%. When she gets to 35 to 37 years of age, 65% of the eggs are going to be chromosomally abnormal. That leaving leaves about 35% normal. When she's 38 to 40, about 29% are normal. When she's in her early 40s, only one in 10 is normal. And when she gets to her, to her mid 40s, at least at the best, you're getting about 2% of her eggs being normal. So there's a decline in egg quality, and this, as previously stated, increases the infertility risk with age. Her fertility goes down, and the miscarriage rate, which also causes, uh, is caused by chromosomal abnormalities in the embryo in most cases, goes up. So let's talk now about intrauterine insemination. This is the procedure. At the time of induced or natural ovulation, a speculum is introduced into the woman's vagina and a thin catheter is passed through the cervix into the uterus and then a small amount of sperm is injected into the uterus. In the early part of the 60s and 70s and even the, the, uh, yes, the early 80s, people used to inject whole sperm into the woman's uterus. They used to use very much reduced amounts 0.2 milliliters of whole sperm because they knew that sperm could cause a major reaction because of the milky fluid surrounding it which we now know contains a lot of prostaglandins this could create a major reaction and deaths have occurred so they used to carefully inject very small amounts of whole sperm it was totally ineffectual it wasn't until the early 80s and I, and I have to tell you we were the first people to recognize that by taking sperm and washing it and separating the milky fluid from the sperm, remember only 2% of an ejaculate is sperm and 98% is the milky seminal plasma that's that in which the sperm is harbored. That if we separated the milky fluid from the sperm and then incubated it and then loaded it into a syringe and injected it, with two things would happen. Number one, we would avoid any of the risks of prostaglandin reactions that occurred with whole sperm. And secondly, that we'd get much higher pregnancy rates. Hardly anybody got pregnant when you injected whole sperm into the uterus. So intrauterine insemination now today is synonymous with injecting washed centrifuge sperm where the milky fluid is separated from the sperm. The sperm is then suspended in a media to enhance it and is then injected into the uterus at the time of ovulation, either natural or induced. But intrauterine insemination is not uniformly successful. You'll see the success rates later. But it is not for everyone. And when I first introduced IUI into the field in 1984 in a publication that I posted in Fertility and Sterility in March or April of that year, we really thought we were onto something that could really replace IVF where the success rate, success rate in those days was dismal. We thought it would work well for cases of male infertility. Whenever a tube was open, IUI should be the first choice because it was relatively safe. It was very inexpensive. And so we thought this is the way to go. But alas, we were seriously wrong. IUI does not work in most of the cases for which it is used today. For example, you're going to learn that IUI does not work when there's endometriosis that is present. It works very poorly because in women with endometriosis there's a toxic pelvic environment and the egg has to pass through that environment to get to the tube where the sperm is waiting. And in the process, its ability to subsequently be fertilized is dramatically reduced almost five or six fold. So where there would be a chance ordinarily of a 30-year-old woman getting pregnant 20% of the time at the age of 30 without endometriosis and everything else being normal with natural conception or IUI, here the chance is going to be about 3% and where the chance normally would be about 80% of a woman having a baby per year of trying if she's fertile and she's young 
and everything else is normal and the husband's fertile, with endometriosis can be 40% in four years. It is absolutely out of the question and should never be used when endometriosis is severe, even if the tubes are open. And by the way, the tubes are usually open till very late in the development of this disease. IUI doesn't work well with endometriosis and it should be avoided whenever possible. When a woman's got endometriosis, the egg is passing through this adverse environment and no matter whether you inject the sperm closer to where the where the where the spur where the egg will reach once it reaches the tube or not, if the egg isn't functional, it's not going to produce a pregnancy. Secondly, IUI should absolutely never be used if there's damaged tubes that are blocked. Even if the tubes are damaged and partially open, IUI is a poor choice and the pregnancy rate is going to be in the single digits per month. It makes no sense to do IUI after you know that there's tubal disease. And then when there's male factor infertility that's moderate or severe, IUI is contraindicated because the pregnancy rate is no greater than when there is no uh, treatment at all. So you don't want to use IUI when there's severe or moderately severe male infertility. I will tell you, and I'll admit to the fact that in 1984, when I wrote the paper on IUI, I thought this would end up being a cure for male infertility. And how wrong was I? I had to backpedal because IUI does not work when there's male infertility. And yet one of the commonest reasons that people get uh, to do intrauterine insemination today is because of, the, of male infertility, thinking that you can enhance the sperm and bypass the problem with IUI, and you cannot. It's also often used with endometriosis, thinking that because the tubes are open, by getting the sperm closer to the egg, where it reaches the tube, you're better off, and that doesn't work well either. So absolute contraindications are blocked tubes, advanced endometriosis, and moderate or severe male infertility. For those, only IVF works. When there, there are also relative contraindications for doing IUI. And the first one is when the woman is over 40. The pregnancy rate with IUI in women over 40 is under 2%. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever in a woman that's older and running out of time when her ovarian reserve is depleting because of age and her egg quality is declining to waste time on a procedure that's got a 2% chance of success. Women being treated for infertility over the age of 40 should do IVF, in my opinion. The second in, uh, place of a relative contraindication is if there's evidence that the woman's running out of time because she is running out of eggs. She's getting closer to the point where she'll go into menopause. In other words, her ovarian reserve is declining. And the way in which you detect that primarily is AMH and FSH, as I mentioned earlier. In my opinion, if the woman's AMH is under one nanogram per milliliter, it's not a good idea to do IUI because she doesn't have the time for you to be wrong. The next time you come around, she may not be able to produce eggs and a few months later, her AMH could be under 0.5 and she's imminently menopausal. And at that point, even IVF, which she needs if she's got diminished reserve, will not work. So to do IUI when there is significantly diminished ovarian reserve, in my opinion, is wrong. And for the reasons I gave you, even mild endometriosis, it isn't ideal. But it's certainly not ideal in a woman over 35 years of age who has even mild endometriosis, because with every month or six months or year that passes after the mid-30s, her, her egg quality is declining and you don't want to waste valuable time. Over 35, with any degree of endometriosis, in my opinion, is an indication to consider IVF preferentially. Under 35, it, it's doubtful that IUI is going to help. But if you do it, it's not, if you try it, it's not such a crime as long as you understand that you have to tell the woman that her chances of getting pregnant are five times lower than if she never had the condition so she can make a judgment call. And then when there are anti-sperm antibodies in the man or in the woman, 
IUI usually is unsuccessful. And I've put it here as a relative contraindication because some people try to wash the sperm or let it ascend through little beads so that the antibodies will be shaved off and use it then and some pregnancies have been reported. But to me, in my opinion, the presence of significant amounts of anti-sperm antibodies in either the male or the female indication should really belong in this category of an absolute in contraindication because it so rarely is successful. Now, about the indications then. Who really can benefit from IUI and some people do? Well, the first one that may benefit is when you're using frozen sperm be it donor sperm or husband sperm that's been frozen. Remember, when you freeze sperm, you weaken it. And you cannot get good success rates unless you inject it directly into the uterus rather than into the vagina. So frozen sperm use is an indication for IUI. Secondly, if the man cannot ejaculate on his own uh, because of uh, certain problems with ejaculatory function, in those cases, obtaining the sperm through um, electro ejaculation or um, by uh, having the man ejaculate uh, retro by, by having the man uh, have intercourse if he can after the use of Viagra and then taking that sperm and inseminating it is a way to go. Ejaculatory problems are one of the relative indications for IUI. Perhaps when there's mild male factor and in my honest opinion, that's often that's usually because we so commonly misdiagnose men as having mild male factor that they sometimes get pr uh, achieve a pregnancy through IUI and their partners. I believe that with true male factor, it probably won't work. But the man is often given the blame for failure to conceive when the doctor can't find any other cause for infertility. Often those are labeled mild male inf factor infertility where they really are not. But mild male factor is a relative indication for IUI. The other indication is when there's ovulation dysfunction and you're using fertility drugs on the woman to make her produce more follicles and better develop follicles. Then the performance of intrauterine insemination can help you better time insemination and get the sperm to where it needs to be in, into the... Uh, reproductive tract in an appropriate fashion and quickly. But remember, intrauterine insemination is only going to be successful if the insemination is done before the woman ovulates. And that's why it's so important for timing purposes to find out when you give the woman the HCG trigger to make her ovulate and then perhaps 26 hours later or 30 hours later to inseminate the sperm. And of course, then there's cases of unexplained infertility, which oftentimes are just undiagnosed. Many of these will get pregnant, but uh, in, in a lot of cases, the unexplained infertility is due to endometriosis that wasn't diagnosed or due to anti-sperm antibodies or due to an immunologic cause where the embryo is being rejected. And when you do IUI in unexplained infertility, given that so many of them have an immunologic cause either in the uterus or because of antibodies to sperm, or because you're not diagnosing early endometriosis or early pelvic adhesions, that is why IUI doesn't do that well very often when you use it in unexplained infertility. So what you can see from this important slide is that IUI is not all that I really believed it was going to be when I first introduced it. And it's not what we all think that it is an excellent alternative to IVF. In fact, to be very honest, and please listen to this carefully, there's a lot of dispute as to whether using intrauterine insemination in the, for these indications, other than when you're using it for frozen sperm or ejaculation problems, whether it has any better, any greater likelihood of producing a pregnancy than well-timed intercourse with fertility drugs. I'll say that again. There's a lot of controversy as to whether IUI even benefits anyone. 
whether it might not be just as good to give the woman fertility drugs and ask her to try with timed intercourse to occur immediately prior, prior to ovulation might be just as good as doing IUI. And this is coming from someone who, is, who feels very proud of having introduced the whole concept in the early 80s. I don't think it's all that I thought or that we thought or that many still think it might be cut out to be. So to do IUI, what has to happen? Well, one, you have to have certain requirements that are met. First, the woman, of course, has to have at least one open tube. The sperm function needs to be adequate after washing. There should be at least 10 million motile sperm present after washing per milliliter. And the woman needs to be, have to be made to ovulate or ovulate on her own. And the uterus needs to be receptive with a thick enough lining, free of surface lesions such as polyps and scar tissue and fibroids. And it need, there needs to be no immunologic impediment to implantation. These are the, the four sine qua non prerequisites, in my opinion, necessary before a woman does IUI. Quickly, let's look at some of the tests. I showed you this is a, I told you about the hysterosalpingogram. Dye is injected. You can see this is a normal one. It's going through a very thin tube and spilling out at the ends of the tubes. This shows bilateral patency and a normal uterus, what looks like a normal uterus, but because this dye is an iodide, there could be a polyp or fibroid protruding into the uterus or scarring that you won't see by this test. Here's an HSG done when the tubes are blocked. As you can see, these are called hydrosalpings because they distended with fluid and the ends of the tubes that are normally finger-like projections are clubbed because the infection has been enclosed and enveloped to contain it by the body. And this is full of fluid or pus. Here, IUI, of course, is a complete waste of time, even though it looks like a small amount of dye is ex coming out of the end of this tube under pressure. This is an absolute no-no. Even if this tube is fixed and opened surgically, you can't fix the damage that's been done to the walls of the tubes, so IUI won't work. This is what we call a normal semen analysis, where the man has more than 20 million sperm per milliliter, more than half of them are motile, and there's a good uh, no, more than 4% are normal in their appearance and structure by the Kruger classification, which is the strict criteria for sperm evaluation. This is where you look in the uterus with a hysteroscope and you can see these polyps, this polyp in the uterus sticking out by looking inside, injecting water and then seeing the polyp. This was then removed and afterwards the uterus was clear was removed by surgically snipping the base of the polyp and removing it. Here you see surface lesions in the uterus as a cause of implantation failure. These are submucous fibroids. This is a fibroid polyp on a little stem like a mushroom sticking out there. You do the hysteroscopy and you clip that off over there and the polyp is gone. This one is called a submucosal fibroid and this fibroid is not hanging into the uterus through a stem like this. You can't just snip it off. You've got to do hysteroscopy and literally dig it out the uterus. Some doctors will f simply shave away the part that's sticking into the uterus. That's an inadequate treatment. It doesn't remove the foreign body response caused by that lesion just below the lining of the uterus. The polyp must be removed in its entirety to render the uterus receptive. These polyps that are in the wall and outside the uterus will usually not interfere with implantation. This is another picture of a hysterosalpingogram where dye is injected into the uterus and what you see here is scar tissue. This is a scar band of scar tissue in the uterine cavity. This is what happens after infection has occurred when a pregnancy went wrong either following an abortion, a miscarriage, or following on the birth of a child where post-pregnancy endometritis occurs. 
And this is the last one on the line on the receptivity issue, the second last one. Here you see a lining of a uterus by ultrasound. It measures 11 millimeters in thickness and it has a triple line appearance. And you measure this just prior to ovulation. This is a good lining with a good receptivity in terms of its anatomical structure. And the last one I'm definitely not going to go into here is when there's immunologic issues affecting natural killer cells and cytotoxic lymphocytes in the uterus. As I said, a third of, of women with endometriosis will have activated natural killer cells. 50% of women with immunologic hypothyroidism will end up having these activated natural killer cells. And many women without any known cause will have it. And you'll often see it in women with a family history of immune disorders like lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, or hypothyroidism. It doesn't matter whether you do IUI, IVF, or nothing. Nobody's going to get pregnant easily unless you, comf you suppress the toxins, the Th1 cytokines that are released in excess when these cells are activated. And this is done through treatment with intralipid and steroids such as dexamethasone and prednisone. Again, intralipid has to be given two weeks, 10 days to two weeks ideally, before the embryos are transferred, but no later than seven days before the embryos are transferred or before, yeah. So when we stimulate for IUI, what do we do? Well, traditionally, people tend to give clomiphene, so I'm, I'm going to separate that out and talk about it later because this is has to be understood that clomiphene has certain drawbacks. A new drug called letrozole is better than clomiphene and gets somewhat of the same effects and can be used for IUI. Both these drugs are taken orally. And then there's injectable fertility drugs such as FSH, Puragon, uh, Folistam or Gonalef or Menopur. These are drugs that are used to make the ovaries produce multiple eggs and they are the be that is the, by far the best way to use fertility drugs for IUI. And then there's natural cycle IUI where you just simply inseminate the sperm at the time of natural ovulation. Frankly, in my opinion, it's a dismal treatment. It has very poor results and I do not recommend it for anybody. Except when you're doing it in cases of donor sperm insemination, where you're injecting donor sperm that's been separated and washed and inje for injection. Then natural cycle IUI is uh, applicable. So let's talk a bit about clomiphene and clomid and why I think it's so bad. Uh, it's not bad in the sense that it doesn't work, but everybody has to understand that there's at least a 20% reduction in the pregnancy rate when IUI is done with clomid. Clomid, because it's an anti-estrogen, and it has other effects, such as I told you earlier on, in 20% of cases causes Luff syndrome or trapped ovulation. And because many doctors use it more than three times in a row, whenever Clomid is used more than three months in a row without a break, it starts acting like an anti-fertility drug. You've got to stop using Clomid after three months and give the body at least a full month's break before you can come back and use it again which I don't think is a good idea in the first place. But if you're going to do clomiphene or clomid IUIs, it's got to be used um, and administered from the second to the fifth day of the cycle, 50 at maximum 100 milligrams a day, and it should never be used more than three times in a row unless there's more than a month's break between the attempts. And bear in mind that no matter what you do, the success rates are 20 to 30 times lower, as I said here, than it is when you use drugs such as FSH, uh, gonadotropins, menopure, folistam, gonalef. The main reasons why it's much lower is because clomid, as I said, is an anti-estrogen. It makes the mucus thicker so the sperm can't get through, and it thins the uterine lining because it's an anti-estrogen. And it, it thins the lining because estrogen can no longer make the lining develop as easily as it would do in the absence of an anti-estrogen. So clomiphene is much less successful 
than using injectable fertility drugs. It costs a bit more, but a bit less, but it is much less likely to produce a pregnancy. And what you're paying for is not to do the, for the cost of an IUI. You're paying to have a baby. So if you're going to use these drugs, it's better to use the injectable fertility drugs. What is the overall success rate with IUI? You can see it can get up to close to 15 to 20 percent, but then after the age of 30, the, the rates drop down to, as I told you, in the 40s to about 2 percent. So you really uh, want to never use clomiphene after the age of when the woman's beyond 39 years of age. The success rates are shown here. Less than 2% over 40, 7 to 8 to 8% 8 for 35 to 39, 12% to 30 to 35, and about 15% for women under 30. This is the best time if you're going to use IUI and ideally stop at about 35 years of age. At that point, you need to start looking more towards IVF. And what about this, the, the chances of success in repeated IUI cycles? This shows you with injectable fertility drugs that it's around 15 to 20 percent in the first three attempts, and then it drops. If you're not pregnant after three attempts, it drops down to under 6 percent for the remaining three attempts. So if you've done three tries of IUI and you're not pregnant, it's time to quit and to consider moving to IVF. Here's an interesting slide. It shows you the slide about women with unexplained infertility. Remember I told you earlier on unexplained infertility is usually not truly unexplained. It's undiagnosed. And very often it's due to conditions for which IUI is not meant. It's often due to endometriosis, which you can only see if you do a laparoscopy and you won't see with an HSG. It, it, it won't uh, succeed if the woman has diminished ovarian reserve. It won't succeed if the woman's over the age of 39, 40. And it won't succeed if there are immunologic causes. And because many of these unexplained infertilities fall in this realm, tells you why the success rate tends to be lower in this group. Firstly, the ones I really want you to look at are these in yellow. If you use clomiphene and IUI and compare it to no treatment, the cycle, the baby rate with clomiphene per cycle is 6% in unexplained infertility versus 3% per cycle with no treatment. But if you use injectable fertility drugs and you compare it to, to no treatment with IUI, then 9% is the success rate and versus 2% if there's no stimulation being used at all. So in unexplained infertility, contrary to popular belief, IUI is not such a great thing. So now let's quickly look at IVF and then we'll stop. Who needs IVF? When should it be a, a, uh, a the first choice? Well, I've already told you when there's a tubal factor with pelvic adhesions, at any age, IVF is the first choice and IUI is not a good choice. When there's male factor infertility that is moderate or severe, definitely you do ICSI and IVF and not IUI. And I again emphasize that too many people are undergoing IUI under the belief that because there's male infertility, it will improve their chances and I promise you it will not. If the woman's over 39, if she's in her 40s, and there's only a 2% chance of IUI per cycle, that certainly is not an indication to do it. If the woman's ovarian reserve is diminished and she doesn't have time to waste, certainly IUI is not the way to go. If she's got natural killer cells that are activated, you really don't want to do IUI and also another form of immune problem when there's sperm antibodies, you don't want to do IUI, you've got to do ICSI and IVF. If the woman needs gender selection, she wants a boy or a girl, we used to believe that there were tests that we could use. Uh, there used to be a test called Microsort, which is no longer being approved by the FDA. These tests that are intended by centrifugation or by uh, using um, 
a flow cytometry to separate the male bearing from the female bearing sperm and then doing inseminations, in my opinion, are really ineffectual. If you want to select which embryo to put in the uterus, if you want to get a, a particular gender, then you need IVF with gender selection through doing CGH. I told you when a woman's got endometriosis of any degree over 35 years of age, she needs IVF preferentially, and if she's got severe endometriosis at any age, she needs IVF. And then finally, if you've tried IUI three times and it's failed, it's time to move to IVF. With IVF, a woman under the age of 35 should have about a 50% chance of a pregnancy and better than a 40% chance in a good fertility center of having a baby per cycle. And if you include frozen cycles into that, it's probably closer to a 50-50 chance of having a baby or better. And if you get to do two cycles, that can move well to over 80% chance of a baby if you consider two full IVF cycles with frozen and fresh attempts. Also, with IVF, you can detect which embryos are of better quality by doing pre-implantation genetic testing through CGH. And then you can put back embryos that are good selectively and improve the pregnancy rate even further. So there's no doubt that you can get very high success rates with IVF. Obviously, doing conventional IVF, the older the woman becomes, the lower the success rate and the higher the miscarriage rate. So the advantages of IVF are pretty clear. Dramatically improved success rates. It allows you to assess ovarian reserve because you get to assess how the woman responds to fertility drugs. It allows control over the number of embryos you put in the uterus. With IUI, if the woman ovulates and releases a lot of eggs, she can have triplets, quadruplets, or even greater. Especially women with conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, who release lots of eggs at a time. IVF protects by allowing you to only put back one or two and thereby dramatically improve the chances of having a singleton or no more than a twin pregnancy over IUI. And then finally, there is IVF allows you to preserve eggs that are not used because those can be then fertilized and vitrified and cryopreserved for subsequent dispensation. And with modern methods of freezing embryos and thawing them and putting them back, the baby rate per transfer is no worse and possibly even better than with fresh IVF. Thank you very, very much for your attention. But before we go any further, I'd like to remind everybody first to post your questions on the uh, question on the area set aside for questions. And I also want you to remember that everybody who attended the seminar today is free to call, just write down the 800 number again, 1-800-780-7437 and set up a Skype consultation with me so we can discuss your case in detail. Call tomorrow or the next day and ask for Tina. So now we're going to go to the board so I can see how many have posted questions. And here we go. Um, let's start with the, at the bottom here with Kelly. Kelly says she has, endometri she has endometriosis and PCOS. And the husband has problems with the sperm. Um, obviously, Kelly, at, uh, from your perspective, it's very, very important to do IVF with ICSI because that's the only way that you've got a reasonable chance of getting pregnant. Frankly, clomiphene and IUI, in my opinion, is a, is, a, is a ridiculous option for you. And if you've also on top of it got immunologic problems, you've got every indication in the book why you don't want to even think of IUI and you want to start IVF with ICSI. The second question from Kelly is, um, it's supposed to be testosterone replacement therapy. Yes, I, I strongly advise against the use of agents such as DHEA. This is my opinion because it converts to testosterone in the ovary. And if too much ovarian testosterone is produced, it will interfere with implantation. Um, it will interfere, sorry, with embryo quality dramatically and increase the risk of abnormalities. 
Um, it says, I'm really shocked that I even got pregnant. This is Kelly with IUI with endometriosis. I just want to point out, Kelly, nothing is impossible. Let me make a point that's very worthwhile point, uh, mentioning here. Endometriosis is one of the commonest causes of secondary infertility because what happens is you get pregnant by fluke. You think you got pregnant because of the fertility drugs and the IUI, but you actually got pregnant in spite of that treatment. And the effect is that your doctor thinks you got pregnant because of it and comes back and does it again and again and says to you, look, you got pregnant the first time, you'll get pregnant again, just give it time. And the problem is you got pregnant in spite of it and not due to it. And repeatedly doing this over and over just wastes more time. And at the end of the day, you're unable to conceive and you're getting older. And now the biological clock plays a role. The fact that you miscarried um, uh, but the betas uh, confirmed the pregnancy uh, only suggests that you probably had an immunologic issue as well and that immunologic issue and a lining of undies only six millimeters all of those things explain why the IUI didn't work my guess is Kelly and you might want to post later and tell me if I'm right is that you used clomiphene or clomid and took it for more than three months in a row because 80% of women who take clomid for more than three months without a break will have a thin lining there's another um, a question here which says thank you for the insights and then it says, uh, from an approach to IVF perspective, for a couple less than 35 years of age with, under, with unexplained infertility, would you recommend first undergoing any diagnostic tests that establish the requirements for IVF? Absolutely. Unexplained IVF has to be explained before you even do IVF. Otherwise, you may do IVF and waste your time. Think of it. Let's say you've got an immunologic problem and you don't know about it. You'll do IVF and put the embryo into the uterus and it still won't take because the, uh, the root system of the embryo will be destroyed. So yes, you must exclude all of the, or must look at all those things that I spoke about as prerequisites. You must know what's going on before you go and do IVF. Um, next question said says, what is the best option for a couple with a woman as Asherman syndrome? Asherman syndrome is a condition that I showed you the one HSG picture on where there was scar tissue in the uterus. Well, the first option is to try to free the scarring and then come back and see whether you can produce a decent lining. Unfortunately, with Asherman syndrome, it's almost always caused by an infection that occurred with pregnancy and after a pregnancy where some of the products of the placenta or the miscarriage remained in place and became infected and spread throughout the uterus and damaged the lining. So when that's destroyed the uterine lining, you're not going to get pregnant if that lining cannot at least get to an 8 millimeter thickness on estrogen. If you can't get to that level after removing the, lesion, the adhesions in the uterus, then you need a gestational carrier nothing else will be successful Jessica writes what are the long-term effects of the overuse of clomiphene um, and I've lost that where is it now um, you were on high dosage clomiphene I see for six months well six months you're probably okay Jessica but when you start taking clomiphene for more than a year it can really have in my opinion some really risky effects um, clomiphene is made was was de was developed from a product known as DES, which caused a tremendous amount of uh, reproductive cancers of the lower reproductive tract in women, and it really DES was fashioned to form clomiphene. The problem is that DES uh, causes malignant conditions. And I believe that there's some evidence from animal studies that if you take clomiphene uninterrupted for more than a year, it can increase the risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And I don't think you should be on clomiphene forever for more than three months without a break. Besides, after three months, 80% of the women on clomiphene will miscarry or not get pregnant. So why waste your time for more than three cycles in a row? 
Jammer Rose with his rights. We did a couple of IUI cycles with Clomiphen and never never got pregnant. We used over the power uh, over the counter preg uh, ovulation predictor tests and measured the basal body temperature. And you'd like to know if it would be helpful to do IUI in that setting. I showed you a slide earlier on which shows that if you do IUI without any fertility drugs, the pregnancy rate is not going to increase over no treatment at all. So I don't believe that IUI is indicated without stimulation, unless you're doing it for the use of donor sperm that's been frozen. Christina writes, my husband's semen analysis has always been normal. He came back from deployment and his semen analysis came back at nearly zero and normal morphology and his count dropped drastically. Christina, that needs to be investigated to see why. One of the things you need to consider is that the enormous stress brought about by the battlefield environment can cause hypothalamic brain related causes of reduced sperm production. So your husband needs to see a doctor that can test his FSH, his LH and his testosterone levels and he also needs to uh, see a urologist to make sure there's no obstruction to his sperm ducts. But you, one of the things that can be treated very effectively in men is if it's due to a stress-related cause, just like in women who can lose ovulation under great uh, situations of stress. Uh, can you please post the phone number? I, I mentioned the phone number for a free consultation. No, it's not a free consultation. My apologies. It used to be. But I, don't, I can't offer it free anymore because I'm inundated and I can't get to the patients. But it doesn't cost a lot. I think the consultation by Skype is about $150. But the phone number is 800-780-7437. All you need to do is ask for Tina and she'll schedule you as soon as possible. Um, Emily writes, I was successful at getting pregnant in my third IUI cycle, but I miscarried at eight weeks. Does it make sense for me to keep trying with IUI? Emily, three cycles, no baby. Time to consider an alternative, but before you do, you must be evaluated to see why you failed. Is there an immunologic cause? Is there endometriosis? What was the reason for your failure? Because this can impact on how you will respond when you do IVF and what needs to be done to improve your chances. And then comes Christine, where is this? Christina is the next one. Yeah. Will ICSI still help us find enough normal sperm? We also had eight vials of cryosperm sperm from before he was deployed. Absolutely, Christina. ICSI is what must be done if you have to, if you have frozen banked sperm, then it needs to be ICSI with IVF. You can't do regular IVF then. Heather writes, you've talked about the percentages for women 35 and under. What are the chances of a baby, specifically in a woman of 39, at the time of conception? If it's IUI, the chances are going to be about 5% per month or less. If it's IVF, the chances are probably going to be a pregnancy rate of about 40%. But if you do a CGH testing to select the right embryos at 39, and especially if you do embryo banking, per embryo transfer it can be above 60%. So it all depends upon what you want to do. And I suggest that you, um, that you seriously consider um, doing that Skype consultation. I think I'll be able to give you more information there. Heather, you said that your question applies to IVF at 39. I think within two cycles of IVF, if you've got normal ovarian reserve and you, you take into account both the fresh and the frozen cycles, I think the chances of you being pregnant is well over 75% and having a baby, not a pregnancy, but a baby. Of course, each case is different. But that includes two fresh egg retrievals and as many transfers as the available embryos will allow. Um, I see that you that you say, um, I think you, you've just mentioned that you've gone to Dr. Tortriello. I have to tell you something, Kelly. Dr. Tortriello is one of the finest REs in our system and I think anywhere. 
I would have no hesitation sending my daughter to see him. So if you're closer and it's more accessible to go to SRM New York, you're in excellent hands with Dr. Tortoriello. Leticia writes, we've had two failed IVFs in St. Louis. Uh, your husband has no sperm issues other than elevated natural killer cells, which you have. You're waiting for the results of DQ Alpha Leticia. My dear, if you've got activated natural killer cells, you don't want to do IUI. You want to do IVF. And most IVF is autoimmune rather than alloimmune where DQ Alpha is matching. And it's immediately eliminatable. Talk to Dr. Dayal. Tell her you spoke to me. And I told you that in the face of activated natural killer cells, I've recommended absolutely that you go directly to IVF. Kelly again writes, I got pregnant. On, no, is it Kelly again? I got pregnant on the third clomiphene uh, attempt. Uh, where is it? I've lost yeah. it. Um, yes, Dr. Totriello's suggestion of IVF with ICSI is, is great. And thank you. Thank you for your kind words there. I appreciate it. Um, Leticia writes that she did intralipid for both IVFs. This is a term. Uh, your question started where? I don't have the two first. Two failed cycles. You had two failed cycles of IVF. In, uh, you said IVF, I thought you said IUI. Okay, I misread that, Leticia. I truly apologize. If you fail two IVF cycles with intralipid, depending upon your age and other factors being excluded, then you must look for uh, DQ alpha matching because it's hard to explain why you would fail unless the embryos were abnormal. And I would recommend in your next attempt, if you don't have a DQ alpha match, that you do CGH embryo selection because that way you're assuring that the embryos you're replacing are normal, which you don't know when you're doing it, even if the, if the intralipid is given and you know you've got natural killer cell activation, but the embryos you're putting back are not chromosomally normal, you won't get pregnant. Okay, Jamie, Jamie Rose writes, after getting a positive uh, ovulation predictor kit, is an ultrasound helpful or necessary in IUI? Uh, in my opinion, no. I think if you know that you've got a, just got a positive test, you go in and do the IUI on the spot. If you're not sure that the ovulation predictor kit might have been done a bit late and you'd already ovulated, then you can ask the doctor to run an ultrasound and see whether the dominant follicle had already ovulated, in which case you're too late. I had unexplained infertility rights, Melane, um, and I wasted time with IUIs. I just had the NK assay done, and you had increased natural killer cells. Wow. Obviously, you need IVF with intralipid. Obviously, and depending on age, and depending upon where you do it, you shall have an excellent chance of success. IVF, and your AMH is 1.3, which means you're already starting to slip with ovarian reserve, so I would ramp up and move as quickly as you can, Melanie, or Melane. Uh, the next lady writes, That's the same one, yeah. <coughs> you did two IVFs, said Leticia. I got that, Leticia. Um, there's another question, 35 years with borderline sperm DNA fragmentation. Um, mild luteal phase defect, Normal HSG, laparoscopy, endometrium, AMH, would you recommend another diagnostic, any diagnostic test before IVF? Yes, I would certainly do, I would certainly do immune testing. Uh, I would certainly want to know the ovarian reserve. And um, I would, uh, if, you're, if you've got signs of an immune problem or diminished ovarian reserve, I would run to IVF. I don't think mild or borderline uh, DNA fragmentation abnormalities itself would be a direct indication to go to IVF, but certainly if any of the others are positive, I would. And PIXI is a method of trying to identify the best sperm. I'm not convinced that it, that it helps at all, but if it's free and they're offering it, you can do it. Leticia writes, um, if we have 0% match we'll move to CGH t testing. Absolutely, I agree with you, Leticia. That's a good decision. So we've come to the end of the questions, and 
If anybody's got any other questions at the last minute, feel free to post them. Otherwise, we're going to stop. And again, I want to remind every one of you to go to ivfauthority.com and read up on the issues uh, of IUI and IVF and in immunology and all the things endometriosis and unexplained infertility. There are articles I've written there. All you need to do is type the title into the little search bar at the upper right hand corner, click on it and it's going to take you to the relevant articles. Post any questions there on that uh, site and I'll answer them or go to the srmhaveababy.com discussion board and post your questions on the SRM Las Vegas discussion board as quickly and as many as you like and I will get to them very quickly. I also invite every one of you again to go to 1-800-780-7437, call and speak to Tina and set up a Skype consultation with me so I can help you address your particular problem. Many of you here who are talking to me about uh, IUI versus IVF are caught in a, in, a, in a difficult situation where you are hearing someone say to you, do more IUI or do IUI and your infertility is unexplained. And I've shown you that IUI has a place, but it's limited. It's certainly not anywhere near what it's made out to be or what I made it out to be in 1984. It has a place, but if you're older, you have endometriosis, you have diminished ovarian reserve, you have an immunologic problem, or you've already done IUI three times, or there's a male factor, you should really not be doing IUI. You should be moving towards IVF. Thank you all very much for your attendance and for the kind words. And I'm, I hope you all enjoyed the seminar, and I hope it was helpful. God bless and good night.